Good morning to everyone. Let me start the first sentence in German. Guten Morgen und herzlich willkommen zu diesem Insights uh, 2020 webinar, which is all about driving customer-centric growth. Um, first, I would like to say that uh, questions that you have can be uh, addressed in the last 10 to 15 minutes of this webinar. And you can place them on uh, the right-hand side where you have a specific section, um, questions from audience, where you can put them forward. I also would like to ask you to not forget, and I will come back to that at the end, to give feedback and rate this webinar. Thank you already in advance. Um, before tapping um, into the scale, scope, and outcomes of Insights 2020, let me first introduce myself a bit and the company I work for. Uh, as you can see on the screen, my name is Tom Wilms. I'm a senior research director of uh, FAMIR and worked all my life in the insights um, um, area, both on um, agency side at AC Nielsen, but also on advertiser side, uh, Sara Lee and SAB Miller. Um, FAMIR, is um, a company that um, works on the uh, crossroads of three dimensions. That is, the brand expertise is very relevant. Research is a ground to that, and we always try to tie that to business and dollars. And that makes that we play a role in uh, global marketing consultancy. That is mainly what we do. We're a sister to, uh, to Millwood Brown, uh, and working uh, lots of occasions together. For us as Vermeer, um, having set that crossroad, our, our focus is on the juncture of three critical business questions. That's always the why, the what, and the how. Um, and that relates to a brand. Why do we exist? In what business are we in? And how do we build our organization? And we've structured that um, into a couple of practice areas where we uh, really have some expertise. And that starts with purpose, the why question, why do we exist? That follows by strategy, where to play in market and how to win. Um, what's the organization you need for that to deliver um, that win? And what are the capabilities needed for the people working in that organization to achieve sustainable growth, the excellence practice area. And with the dark gray bar, you see business impact. We always try to tie that into dollars to um, uh, make that financial. As for me, we're a truly global um, uh, consultancy company with uh, 14 companies um, uh, across the globe. Um, where Paris is the uh, recently opened office, which is not on this map yet. We advise global clients across lots of industries. Here you have just the selection. And the last one I would like to address um, um, for Vermeer is that we uh, conduct uh, several pieces of um, thought leadership. In 2013, we conducted the Marketing 2020 how to organize for growth um, initiative, which led to a, a Harvard Business Review um, a publication. Um, you can get that from us upon request. Working together with Google to shape the marketing agenda of uh, various uh, brands. And um, now we stepped into Insights 2020, driving customer-centric growth. And that's what I will address with you today. So what we see in the outside world is that society is changing significantly and rapidly. We say that we live in a connected society. And what you see here in, um, in the bar looking from left to right, in 2020, there are approximately 15 billion connected devices around the globe. And that means that there's an enormous amount of behavioral data available to us, not um, um, uh, neglecting the 212 billion sensor-enabled devices. So the data, which we almost 
do not know exactly what we can do with it, what we can derive from it, but it is at least there. There's an ocean of data available. So we can become more customer-centric because we have more data available from customers. But it's not only that we can become more customer-centric, we also must become more con uh, consumer-centric. And that's because traditional business value drivers, they don't cut it anymore. Where in the early days of the previous century, it was all about delivering high quality, you could make a difference and gain a competitive advantage. And that, that is the age of manufacturing. That turn into an age of distribution, being able to distribute your products or services around the world, anytime, any place, but that doesn't cut it anymore either. Then we got the age of information technology. Um, everyone has data. Uh, everyone uh, can do something with it, but currently, it is really knowing your customer, knowing your consumer, truly understand their needs, serving them in a fast and transparent and credible way. That is what truly customer-centric means. So it's not only that we must become more, that we can become more customer-centric based on the explosion of data, but we also must become more customer-centric. Now, a bit um, um, terminology. I'm using the words customer centricity and consumer centricity um, uh, as the same. Because the initiative that we conducted is almost an even split between business to business and business to consumer. So organizations that play a role in business to consumer often call it consumer centricity where organizations that play uh, a bigger role in the business-to-business -business market uh, usually tend to call it customer centricity. We stated it clearly in the questionnaire when we, uh, when we did it. We made a choice to talk about customer centricity, but we mean with it both. So both consumer centricity and customer centricity. And customer centricity it is everyone is almost talking about it. It's, it's a topic in a lot of articles, uh, books have been uh, written about it, but there's one main question that's almost never um, addressed, and that is, does it really drive business growth? And that's the silver bullet we all think and want it to be. And that's, the, to answer that question, we initiated the Insights 2020 initiative. And more specifically, um, there are two questions that we try to answer. That is the what, and that is the how. And the what relates to what are the drivers of customer centricity, whereas the how relates to how can you then achieve a high level of customer centricity. And to give you a bit of background about the scale and scope of this study, um, here you see an overview of the advisory board. Um, you see it's, it's, it's supported by world-class and cross-industry uh, advisory board. One thing to mention from this slide is that Keith Weave, um, you see him on the top left-hand side from Unilever, he was the chairman of the advisory board, uh, and he was also the chairman of our previous initiative, the Marketing 2020 Advisory Board. So knowledge was passed through via him, you could almost say. And it was not only uh, the advisory board, we had a very strong and broad coalition of founding partners. As you see on the left-hand side, ESOMAR and the ARF, um, um, industry bodies, uh, global industry bodies of uh, the research industry. We work together with LinkedIn, Corn Ferry, a talent management and executive search agency, and of course, the family um, of Noah Brown, Kantar, um, um, we're part of that as well. But besides um, global founding partners, we also had some local publishing partners we work together with and um, uh, released information towards um, specific 
countries. So then let's tap into um, the results that came out of this, um, of this study. Um, and I see that there's one slide was passed. I need to go to this one. It was a rather large scale study. What we did, we conducted almost 350 vision interviews with CMOs, with insights leaders and business leaders in the industry across 60 markets. We conducted a quantitative survey um, with a participation of over 10,000 marketing and insights people. And we had some other initiatives to it as well. Um, the working togetherness with LinkedIn, we did some behavioral analysis. I will come back to that. We had some crowdsourcing initiatives with the Wharton School of Management. We also did some secondary research with eight global research teams so that we wouldn't reinvent the wheel again, but that we were really able to add to what's currently there. Um, so the first thing that came across based on those vision interviews is that customer centricity is not just an activity. Customer centricity is a strategy. It's a strategic choice. It is consistently guided by a compelling brand purpose, delivering better and more on true customer needs, and driving growth and commercial business value. So it's on the crossroads of those three dimensions where customer-centric strategy resides. And what we did in our study um, we looked at what overperforming and what underperforming companies do. We compared the scores of companies that grow faster and outperform competitors in terms of business growth. And we compared it to companies that lag behind in terms of growth, the underperformers. And that is something um, that business growth, that's something that we've validated. The business growth was self-reported. Here in the graph, you see on the horizontal axis, self-reported growth on a scale from one to seven. One was significantly lower than competition. Seven was significantly higher than competition. On the vertical axis, you see the actual growth. We were able to do this with um, a subsample um, of uh, the total response from which we knew what company the respondent came from. And um, we used for that uh, information from stock exchange, annual reports, websites like Bloomberg.com and so on, to be able to see whether there's a correlation. And especially if you look at the bottom two boxes, so one and two of the self-reported growth, and the top two box, six and seven of the self-reported growth, you see that respondents are very well able to um, uh, articulate whether they do better or worse than competitors. And it does make sense, because if you're HTC and they recently pu published their latest numbers, then you know that you lag behind in the market and you have competitors who do better. On the other side of the spectrum, take Apple as an example, you know that you do better that you are overperforming, so scoring a six or a seven. So that's how we validated that self-reported business growth really showed a strong correlation with actual business growth. So having said that, um, one of the first questions we asked to the respondents in the um, quant questionnaire, we asked them, how do you see the future? And Insights and analytics and technical developments clearly offers opportunities. What came out of there are the four you see on the screen over here. We can enrich understanding of customers with behavioral data. We can personalize our offerings according, accordingly. And we can bring our insights into action across multiple touch points with our customers. And especially true for overperformers, 
is the latter one, the brand purpose, where they say we can better let our brand purpose guide our actions by intensifying and amplifying our reach. And with a brand purpose, what we mean with that is a North Star to a brand, to a company, so that everyone knows what's the direction to go to for that brand. On the flip side of that, we also ask what are the significant challenges to overcome? And four challenges came out from which the first two are more internal oriented and the second two more external oriented. The inter internal oriented challenges are the internal silos and bureaucracy, struggling with functional silos, internal barriers that hamper collaboration. The legacy of structure and functions that are not designed to deal with the opportunities of today. And the more external oriented challenges are making sense of all data. There's a wealth of data coming towards us. And it's not so much to have the right data, but to make sense out of it all. That's the challenge. And the last one is recruiting whole brain people. And what we mean with that is that people with both the analytical skills to work with data and have the capability to translate data into actions, into clear recommendations, and to use their judgment to interpret data. And interestingly over here is that the two internal oriented challenges are uh, way more uh, true for underperformance. It seems like overperformers have accepted that silo busting is, is a kind of myth. There will always be silos. Uh, the cultural change is needed to deal with those silos rather than to try to find a solution in structure. The second two challenges, making sensible data and recruiting whole brain people, is especially true for overperformance. Um, they feel the challenge to make sense of all the available data and hire the right people to make sense out of all of that. So what, what are the drivers of customer centricity? Our study, in essence, uncovered 10 key drivers of customer centricity. Those are clustered into three dimensions, as you see here on the slide. We've used um, somewhere around 65 variables to, int to identify which drivers contribute the most. And 10 came out of there. And as said, those were clustered into three dimensions. So the first dimension is total experience delivering a total experience to customers. That is um, um, mainly outside oriented. The second dimension is customer obsession. Uh, and the customer obsession is more internal oriented. And the third dimension is about the strategic leverage of insights and analytics, the insights engine. And what we will do is we will zoom into each of those dimensions and uh, the, um, um, uh, address the what of the driver and the how to achieve this step by step with examples to bring it to life. So we first start with the total experience. There are three drivers that um, build this dimension. That is being purpose-led, data-driven customization, and touch point consistency. And I will, I will address them one by one. So the first one is purpose-led. Um, as you can see every time on the right-hand side where you see the statistic, it is what is meant with purpose-led. So here, link everything you do to a clear brand purpose, the score of overperformance, and the score of underperformance. What we see here is that overperformers significantly more link everything they do to a clear brand purpose compared to underperformers, 80% versus 32%. Brand purpose serves as a north star, so to say. It guides all decisions. It gives a 
crystal clear direction on what you stand for towards customers, towards consumers, towards employees, and also towards other stakeholders. Let's go to the example of Whiskas, what you already see on the left-hand side. How to achieve being purpose-led in everything you do? Well, the way Whiskas did that is to illustrate this, how this can be achieved. This was based on a mass qualitative research approach. Whiskas elevated their positioning that was all about care to truly purposeful positioning that is all about nurturing nature or nurturing the cats through nature. And this was derived from the fact that um, people are fascinated by the big cat characteristics they see inside every um, little cat. The way cats move, their physicality, their similarities with their big cousins that live in the wild, tigers, cheetahs, jaguars, panthers, and so on. And this purpose was not only integrated in all brand communication and activities, level zero, so to say, but integrated in their total marketing mix. And a step further, it, it was the North Star for all the decisions that they took, adapting the shape of the palettes and the nutritional profile of the product that was inspired by what the cat really needed rather than what people thought looks nice. And on top of functional and emotional execution of the purpose, Whiskas joined forces with the World Wildlife Fund to create a true societal movement to protect the white tigers in Siberia. And that is how every example of every driver will work. We explain the difference between over and under performance and what we mean with it. So what is the driver about? And then we give you um, some concrete information of how to reach higher levels within that dri uh, driver. So let's go to the next example, actually a very nice one. That is data-driven customization. Um, Overperformance, creating experiences based on data-driven in data insights, much higher than underperformers do. Over here you see, and that will appear sometimes during the presentation, what the score of respondents from companies in Germany scored compared to a global average. It is denoted here in green to show that Germany overperforms the global average on this driver. But as you also can see, overperformers are scoring way higher, so there's still a huge opportunity for growth. The example here is from Allstate. Um, the car industry was um, engaged in, yeah, so to say, a race to the bottom in terms of profit and margin for several years. Extremely low rates to attract new customers. Um, so what, what was usually done is that it was just a fixed amount you had to pay for your insurance for your car, a one-size-fits-all. Then there was a bit of segmentation um, um, uh, used uh, based on risk profiles. But Allstate, they used a device in your car, what you can see on the picture, they call it DriveWise, with an app on your mobile phone. And that um, device registered how you drive, whether it's safe how you drive, and based on your actual performance, you get a discount on the regular insurance amount you have to pay. So this is a really one-to-one -one solution that is um, um, able to, um, uh, to use based on data that can be provided currently. The third driver is touch point consistency. And that relates to insights and analytics to drive consistency across all touch points. And with the number of channels and touch points exploding, the need to create that consistency is getting more and more important. The example here is from Burberry. 
Uh, Burberry has gotten a lot of attention in recent years because of their yeah, seamless integration of on and offline channels. The use of social media and technology and their focus on touch points consistency. And the latest move Burberry um, has made is they extended their brand into the world of an external partner beyond the core of their own brand. They were the first global brand to launch a dedicated channel on Apple Music as it looks to use the partnership to push its music credentials and champion British talent. Staying true to their brand values and play into consumer demands of unique and in this case, local content. A great example of touch point consistency moving from focus on a few moments of truth towards extend to partners. So lay the brand in the hands of your partners. And that is the first dimension of total experience. So let's then move to the dimension of customer obsession. In the dimension of customer obsession, there are four drivers uh, playing an important role. That is embraced by all, leadership priority, collaboration, and experimentation. And before to move to the first one, embraced by all, um, I can tell you that out of all 10 drivers there are, the fourth one, embraced by all, has the biggest impact, the biggest contribution on revenue growth. We have uh, weights for all those dimensions, but uh, for all those drivers, but the fourth one is actually the strongest one, embraced by all. And what do we mean with embraced by all? As you can see here on the slide, customer centricity is fully embraced by all functions in the entire organization. It starts with everyone focusing on the consumer at all levels and across all functions, and even through external partners. Overperforming companies, customer centricity is fully embraced by all those functions. And this contributes the most and set winners apart from losers, 79% versus 13%. Here again, some information of Germany. Germany is um, underperforming here versus the global average. Um, and I will come back to a kind of total sum up um, where we show German uh, numbers, what that means for the whole German situation. So let's go to the, to the how to achieve Embrace by All. Uh, and the example here is from uh, Marriott. Marriott was at the bottom of a UK ranking of customer experience excellence in 2014. And there was an urgent need to improve the experience to drive business results. What they did, they really embraced a culture and strategy of customer centricity. And in a leisure business, you can easily confuse that with customer service. But in Marriott's case, it was truly centricity. Because what they did, they drove a culture of, tr of change, they experimented and um, with customer centricity from the bellhop, the lift boy to the CEO, they enabled technology into loyalty card systems. They built better and customized experience towards them. They embraced a new way of advertising to appeal to millennials. And customer centricity is really back within Marriott on the strategic map in all functions and all decisions they take. So they truly embraced it. And in no more than 12 months, they're back in the top 20 and rising. That was the uh, 2015 score Marriott uh, achieved. So embraced by all, customer centricity is not something that you outsource to a department, level one, outsource to insights and analytics. It needs to go to all functions, processes, and decisions. And the highest level here is that you seamlessly align that with external partners you work with. As said, this was the most important um, driver uh, we found out of the 10. 
Then driver five is leadership priority. Um, Overperformance show that customer centricity is really a top priority for leaders. The 91% versus the 48%. Their leaders truly lead customer centricity from the front. They don't just talk the talk of customer centricity. They also walk the talk by basing incentives on customer-related KPIs, 45% versus 24%. There, and that's interestingly, leaders of customer-centric companies, they like to engage more and share more content on social platforms with customers and consumers. They're reading it, they're sharing it, they're focusing more, leading from the top. Richard Branson is, 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 is a good example of that. He does that all the time with their Virgin customers. Um, he was the first influencer on LinkedIn, by the way, that reached more than 1 million followers, and he continues to do so. The example here is from Credit Karma. And Credit Karma is a, um, Credit Karma is a free credit and financial management platform for U.S. consumers. And they're challenging and changing the way the credit card market is currently structured challenging the likes of Amex and Pfizer. Their leadership, they have a deep customer first belief and an intrinsic drive to help their customers and focus on customers who need that the most. Often people that are financially vulnerable or people that have a high risk of getting into financial trouble rather than prioritizing most profitable customers. They create full transparency for customers. They offer them tools that allows them to track their credit card, loan transactions, balances, all in that Credit Karma interface. They also tailor financial recommendations based on each individual's user credit profile. And they provide a calculator tool for debt repayment, amortization, and so on. They have, um, since mid-2015, 35 million members and 250 employees. And that might not seem that big, but what we all know is that, um, like Amazon, for instance, that's, that, that's a nice example, or Uber or Airbnb, that's where they were a couple of years ago. Because who... Who would have really thought that Amazon would threaten Walmart at some point? And in startups, the signature of the CEO is always very explicit and known by almost everyone. They have in common those leaders that they're obsessed about customer centricity and they voice it wherever they can. They recruit the right people and they more or less embrace that philosophy, uh, philosophy um, uh, to the fullest. Then let's move to driver six, that's collaboration. Um, working closely with customers. That is um, the score of overperformance versus underperformance, 72 versus 45. Germany is uh, lacking behind here versus global average. And what we mean with um, uh, collaboration is that um, um, the example of CoPro describes it probably most well. CoPro is a camera that is designed to capture life's most exciting moments. Um, advertise its products and build a fan base. They post content on YouTube. They actually don't even have an ad agency anymore because their users create content which CoPro is allowed to use. And they make a kind of contest out of there that the nicest movie um, uh, gets a 5,000 euros or dollar uh, reward or whatsoever. So that, that, that's still a very nice thing. But another example from GoPro is related to the picture that you see over there. Um, the guy on the surfboard, he has um, a mouthpiece where he um, um, uh, stuck his GoPro on. And he developed it himself. But it was such a nice invention that 
he worked or Copro worked together with him to um, institutionalize that and they now offer that as a standard product within their range of um, 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 pieces where you can um, um, relate your Copro camera upon. So it's a very nice um, example of collaboration with your end consumers. Driver 7 is about experimentation. Overperformers embrace risk and experimentation, 40%, much more than underperformers do with 13%. It is here more um, a culture that goes further than just managing risks. It embraces a risk taking and a test and learn mentality. And the example here is from um, um, Google, Gmail. You might be aware of the famous 10% rule within Google that you have half a day each week where you can put your time towards what they call pet projects. Need to be somewhat business related, but not directly. And out of that, a couple of people came together and out of that, Gmail was developed. So really contributing to the portfolio Google is offering. So this runs from the base of a risk management mindset to stimulate vocational experimentation and level three, which is, which is more or less within reach, allocate budget for experimentation. I worked in the past for companies who had a 70-20-10 rule. 70% 70 of budget was allocated to what was proven right and what was done before. 20% was allocated to what was proven right, not by you, but by others in the industry. And 10% was fully experimental. You could decide what you wanted to do with it, more or less, yourself. And that is, that is something a lot of companies can do. The highest level here is, of course, the full empowerment. So let's then move to uh, the third and last dimension, the insights engine. Um, where I said before that driver four, embraced by all, was the most important driver. From a dimension point of view, the insights engine dimension is the most important dimension, comparing it to total experience and customer obsession. And there are three drivers within. The leading role of INA, unlocking the power of data, and critical capabilities. So let's first go to the leading role of INA. Um, you see here two statistics. That is, INA is leading the business, and INA reports into the CEO, where uh, the scores of the over and underperformers are stated again, and where we use the German information compared to global average again, where Germany also lags behind, 19% versus the 27%. So. What, what we mean here with INA is leading the business, the leading role of INA, it is not necessarily the department itself. It's not necessarily the function itself. But it is more like INA leading the business means INA are infused to in all business decisions. And um, that INA can mature towards a situation of being a true business partner with a seat at the board table. That's what's meant here with the leading role of INA. Um, it, is, it is critical to have a single version of the truth in your organization, and that can be best brought forward by INA as an insights guardian role. Because if data is in hands of many people and functions, then data can start to live a life on their own. And there's a real risk of wrong conclusions are drawn. The example here is um, from Unilever, where you see on the bottom left Stan, with a very um, difficult um, last name, that he is part, every big decision that is taken at Unilever, Stan is taken into the boardroom. He doesn't have a fixed, an actual seat at the board table, but when a big decision has to be made, and the consumer's voice needs to be heard, Stan is dragged into the boardroom. And that's necessary as he says that himself, because if you're not part of the boardroom in those discussions, then your 
the waiter in the restaurant, or even worse, you're on the menu and you don't have uh, the possibility to discuss with or uh, put your point forward. So on the how to achieve that, we have defined four levels. The first level is that INA has a supporting role, often resides within a marketing department. One level up, it's a bit more to inspire the organization, but it's still very reactive. When it goes to level three, when it challenges the business, it becomes more proactive. And on level four, it is really um, placed to give strategic directions for brands and for um, uh, uh, companies. The Unilever CMI mission relates quite well to this, um, to this driver is to inspire and provoke to enable transformational action. That is how Unilever uses the role of INA within their company. Then the ninth driver, unlocking the power of data. We have here an example of um, LinkedIn. Um, over, and here we see that, that the German average is actually higher than the global average, 60% versus 45%. And note that the 60% is quite close to the 67% of overperformance. Um, the example here is from um, um, uh, LinkedIn, and it is their economic graph, as they call it. Um, it's their goal, it's LinkedIn's goal to build an economic graph, and that is a digital map of the world's economy using skills, jobs, schools, and other data they have to map talent to opportunity at massive scale. An example of how, how they do that is by using a specific skill, take computer science. They see that cities like London are highly competitive, whereas cities like Copenhagen are much less so. And they can then use that data to share it with cities and governments to make them understand or to help them understand what skills are important in those locations. Where should they be looking to attract more talent? And, what, and where is there potentially an outflow of talent for jobs? So they can create migration trends for any skill set and combine that with other data sources to demonstrate the migration of human capital using that to help governments to be more forward thinking about those dimensions. And then the last driver, that's driver 10, is all about critical capabilities for people that work in an INA environment. Um, we have three here, that is business sense, whole brain thinking, and storytelling. So having the appropriate business sense is like the driver's license. That's what you need as a base level, because otherwise you're not a full conversation partner at the board table. But it doesn't make you a fantastic driver. You become a fantastic driver when you also have high uh, capabilities in whole brain thinking. And with whole brain thinking, we mean being able to find creative solutions to complex business questions. And you need to be able, that's the storytelling, to put that into a compelling and concise story to convince um, others in the organization. And that is what um, um, Mondelez um, mainly did. They went to a, through a transformation, reorganized the way how they looked at insights, trained the people, currently have five centers of excellence from which they answer mastery of their research and analytics domain. They have portfolio and growth opportunity identification, base business optimization, pricing, shopper insights, and consumer insights. And they report directly into the chief growth officer, the executive vice president of strategy. So the levels here are fivefold, starting with research and analytics mastery, that's the base, but you need to have that driver's license business acumen, but to become a good driver, it's all about creative solution-oriented thinking, story, compelling storytelling, and strategic 
direction setting. And those are the 10 drivers um, um, we found out of a growth set of approximately 65 that contribute the most to um, actual business growth. And demonstrating, the numbers are illustrative, but we're really um, able to do this. And let me build this slide. We create a scorecard where you can see on the left-hand side all the drivers. You see in the first column of percentages your score as a company because we can assess each and every company. Then we can compare that to the benchmark, whether that's global average, German average, or overperformer. And we can find whether there's a gap versus the benchmark. Then you can define, do I want to grow in this dimension or not? under the column of ambition. And at the end, with um, 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 an engine behind that computes the relation towards that revenue growth, where does that lead to? In this case, to a almost plus 3% revenue growth. And this can be conducted for each and every um, organization that's interested to that. So that brings me to um, uh, a summing up, a rounding off what you've seen um, now, and we brought that together in a couple of now what's. The first now what I would like to um, uh, address is that it is not anymore the focus um, on products and services. Um, and I know and I do understand that each of you will be at different stages in the consumer experience journey. That's the lens to look at when we're um, uh, dealing with customers. It goes beyond the product itself. It goes beyond the service itself. It's the total experience that makes a difference, be it big or small, that make in the day of a life of your consumer. That's something to never forget. The second now what relates to data. I would almost say forget about 100% detail and correctness of the data. Focus on the accessibility and increase the actionability. Many, many companies have high paid data scientists spending lots of time and energy creating the perfect data set, cleaning and managing that all day. You might question whether that's a wise investment. Um, and that is um, uh, what is meant with from focus on detail of data to focus on actionability of data. The third now what is that stop manage risks, start experimenting. And this is closer than you might expect upfront. Allocate some of your budget, allocate some of your time to learn and become more future oriented. It is not only budget and time, it is a mindset that failure is an option. Embrace the power of experimentation, I would say. And the last now what is that we move, don't just validate what you deliver to uh, customers, but reach out to them and find ways to co-create with them and innovate with them. Find new platforms where you can interact and rapidly deliver new solutions and enhance that customer experience. Go out with consumers, be with consumers, talk to them, walk with them, eat with them and drink with them. I think that's, that's, it's fun doing so and it really will be contagious. So what we do um, with Insights 2020, we use that, what you saw as the supporting scorecard, we use it as a tool to drive customer centricity in companies. That's, that's, let's say, the, 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 the bigger solution. But we can also do um, uh, workshops and um, growth opportunity workshops, self-assessment, or keynote speeches um, within your company if you're um, interested in that, and you could let us know uh, anytime. So 
that brings it um, that brings it to the end of uh, this webinar uh, webinar uh, for me. I would like to thank you for your um, uh, listening and for your participation here. Here you see um, uh, the two email addresses of people you can reach out to if you want to have further information or um, whatsoever. We have a bit of time left um, for some questions. You can um, put them forward into the right side of your screen um, and then we will be able to answer them for you. So I give it um, I give it a two minutes to see whether something comes up. There's by the way one thing I remember I promised you, but I haven't addressed yet. That is putting the German results into a bit better context. Um, you've seen the results of, of Germany versus global average. And it was um, uh, linking uh, um, um, uh, uh, data sources. It was, um, um, but not everyone embraced it by the food. So it looks like the fundament is there, but the culture or um, the way how to approach it with embraced by all and um, um, uh, being able to, to get people enthusiastic about it, that's where the real challenge lies if you look at this from, uh, from a German perspective. I forgot to mention that um, in a minute. So if there are um, no questions uh, from your side, I don't see anything popping up. Again, you can always reach us as the, uh, at the uh, email addresses that you see on the screen currently. Um, I would like to ask you again not to forget to rate um, this webinar. That gives us lots of information for future uh, webinars to serve you even better. We want to be uh, customer-centric as well, I would almost say. And um, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, being with us, and I hope you really enjoyed it. I wish you a very nice day and uh, maybe till the next time. I have a question um, that was put forward. Why did you specifically put a focus on Germany here? Um, the study is, um, let's, let's try to answer them, them in this way. The study is truly global. 60 countries were involved and we, we really were able to cover the globe with um, Asia Pacific, with Americas, with uh, Europe, Africa, or a third, a third, a third approximately. That is, that is one. Two is this webinar um, um, was given or hosted by Miller Brown in Germany. So all the um, information I shared with you are global outcomes of overperformance and underperformance. But we wanted to put in some German specific information there because the hosting of this webinar was um, uh, specifically for Germany. So I hope that um, that answers um, the question that came in.
Okay, um, there are no more questions coming in, so I would like to stop this webinar. Um, again, thank you very much for being with us. Do not forget to give us the ratings um, as uh, asked for before, really valuable to us. Really appreciate if you could do that. And again, wishing you a nice day, and we will close this webinar within a couple of uh, minutes. Thank you again, and bye-bye.